there and welcome to Yes City 360. I'm your host, Dilba Shatterson, and today I'd like to dive into the heart and soul of what drives the Buddhist Siji Foundation and other charities like it. It's volunteerism that gives a human face to the ideals of compassion and its partner relief. But what happens when that same spirit travels across continents, cultures, and faiths? The desire to inspire and to help your fellow man is a universal feeling to be sure. But does how those goals get achieved change in different environments? To help us learn the answers to that and more, I have the privilege of being joined today by two very special guests from organizations that have not only paved the way for volunteerism, but also open dialogue throughout our nation. So without further ado, let's visit a familiar friend of Tsiji, the American Red Cross. On June 18, 2008, Representative Julie Choi of the American Red Cross and the members of the Tsuji Foundation signed a Memorandum of Understanding at the Tsuji Humanity Center in Taipei. I remember during Gustav and Ike, um, especially in Texas, your volunteers and your leaders, you helped us shelter together. You helped with client assistance and financial assistance and recovery. Because it's such a diverse community, you were really the only organization that could say from day one that you had language capacity. So that was a tremendous asset and resource for the local community and the clients. But I think it was also a very important learning lesson for all the other disaster organizations. So it's just been an amazing partnership. And I think we both expect and demand that we do so much more moving forward. Your local volunteers and our local chapters are also working closely every day um, in those small fire disaster events. And we know to that client, to that family, that single family fire is a big event. It's a big disaster in their lives. But I think with our local stronger relationship as well, it's just an incredible demonstration and evidence of our growing partnership. Because to make it work, it has to grow locally and it has to grow at the national level. I think the recognition of Suchi Foundation USA and your disaster program through the national VOAD community, through the FEMA community, Homeland Security, there's a growing recognition of how important and Suchi is in disaster and what you have to offer. The American Red Cross and Suchi combine their respective strengths and cooperate in disaster relief operations, emergency preparedness and response, cross-training and other cooperative actions in the United States. Hello! Hello! How are you doing, Kelly? I'm great, how are you? I'm great, I'm great. Thanks for having us here. You're welcome. Would you mind showing me around? Sure. Upstairs we have mm -hmm. uh, long-term recovery, so we have case managers who are managing um, people who have been affected by Sandy, so there are about 75 people upstairs. This is development. These are people who raise money, mm -hmm. and uh, downstairs is, is response. That's where my staff sit on the second floor. Mm -hmm. So, And then the first floor you guys saw, right? Right, right, right. It's a pretty lofty space there. Yeah. So. I'd like to go back to the origins of the Red Cross and the role that volunteerism has played since the beginning. And tell, can you tell me how it's changed? It was very much a volunteer-led organization in its early days, and um, we still maintain that volunteer-led approach. Uh, but we also have a, a very large um, paid staff, and so um, we try to balance that. And this is an example of, um, that was the Metro North Derail job, but that was a long time after the job. Um, this was uh, Boston Market, they gave us a Thanksgiving meal, so we served Thanksgiving meal on, on uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, this is, um, we, we call this mass care. So Kelly, would you be able to tell me about the pictures that grace the front entrance? So these are the people who make up the American Red Cross in Greater New York. And uh, there are a couple of paid staff there, but most of these folks are volunteers and they bring so much to the organization. Uh, I look at Una there and she is uh, a volunteer who lives in Queens. And we can call Una at two o'clock in the morning and say, will you go run a big 
chaotic shelter for us, and she never says no. Well, what would you also say are the demographics generally of your volunteers? Who, who composes your body of volunteers? I'd like to say to you that our demographics reflect our community. The population of our volunteers is much more diverse than in most other chapters around the United States. But it's not as diverse as, as the community. So it is predominantly uh, white, it's predominantly uh, older, it skews old uh, rather than younger, and um, that's something that we're working hard to, to improve. We've got actually very um, active programs to try to diversify our volunteer base and, and also at a separate program to try to bring more kids and more youth. And so what do you feel are the Red Cross's strengths but also its weaknesses in trying to keep them coming back? Our strengths are that we present a, an organization that is orderly and people understand. So we can say, here's the process, here's the next step, here's the step after that, and when you're there, this is what it's going to look like. And so lots of people like that part. Um, the weaknesses are that sometimes it's not as human as it needs to be. Sometimes it seems transactional rather than collaborative and social. What would you say are the, issue, the main issues in consistency and also the one-timers? For us, it's consistency in... Um, in that engagement. Greater New York covers a region with a population of 13 million people. My department, Disaster Services, has about 60 paid staff, and we have about 3,000 volunteers, people who have been through that onboarding process. I couldn't today call every one of those volunteers and expect that they're gonna show up today. So engaging 3,000 volunteers is itself a challenge, and so if we can consistently do that, we have a very powerful organization Let's say the next coming disaster or next coming event that you need to be prepared for with your team. What would you say the process is like? Because I know that there's a meeting today for that as well. The need in a disaster is uh, extreme in the earliest hours. So your ability to serve that need is at its lowest point. So there's a tremendous gap there. The only way to get over that gap is to activate in advance and stand ready. And so that's what we must do. We must think about what the worst case scenario is, and then we turn everything on. Well, may we go have a look, actually? Sure. All right, let's go. Kelly, would you be able to explain the uh, emergency operations center that we're in right now? So this room is uh, built for large disasters. It is a command center. It is connected to all of the operations that we conduct on the ground. So when it comes to resources, um, specifically when we talk about funding, how does it work between headquarters in D.C. and also the other offices like here in New York? So we have a motto here called One Red Cross. In the past, the Red Cross had individual chapters and regions and they worked autonomously. Um, over the past several years, all of those chapters and regions have been brought together into uh, a corporate-like structure. The Every Tsuji office and service center, they are self-sufficient. What do you make of that? That's a very different model. Those individual offices have to be connected to their communities in a very tangible way. We're connected as well, um, but in our structure, if uh, one chapter, for instance, has uh, an issue and they're not raising a lot of money, we have a way to support them in, uh, from other places. But I think the, the Suchi model in some ways is more lasting. So in January, you were at the Flushing Tsuji office. It was a meeting of the minds for disaster relief. And so when someone had mentioned that volunteers of Tsuji pay their own way to go on these trips. I, I remember I saw your eyes kind of widen. So why? I thought, I, thought, I, thought it was, I thought you were kidding. It's just something that I can't imagine doing. You know, we spent a lot of time in the Philippines over the past several months. And if we said, you know, we'd like you to come and, and help in the Philippines, but you have to pay your own way, I'm not sure how many folks we get to go. Do you think that it, you can attribute that perhaps to a difference in the concept of American volunteerism? Or is that something that is just different organization to organization? I think there's a bit of uh, an American attitude there. 
I think it's just the way that we compartmentalize our lives and our relationships. Our expectation for most things outside the home uh, is almost like a business partnership. And you have your responsibilities and I have mine. I think the Suchi model is more like, I'm gonna just commit myself to doing this. And so that is, that is I think, cultural in some way. I actually want to go back to the origins of the Red Cross, which was started by Clara Barton. How would you say that the organization up till this point has been able to retain those kind of same grassroots intentions that she started the organization with? It has retained the mission. And I think that is the best part of the organization. It is here for one reason and one reason only, and that is to alleviate human suffering uh, during disasters. It's a very powerful mission. But the, the, the organization itself is very different from it was then. It's a modern organization. It has modern budgeting. It has modern management techniques. It uses modern equipment. So the mission is there, but, but the organization is very different. And the way that we achieve the mission is different. Mm -hmm. So what is your hope for for, for working with Siji in the future? I think it's a tremendous partnership. I think there's so many, so many potential benefits there and um, they bring such a consistency to, to whatever they do. And I think we could benefit from that because we, we can be very powerful and very effective. You mentioned about um, how you just kind of hope that there can kind of be like a disaster relief marriage. Yeah, well, the, you know, we can't do it ourselves, so we have to create a partnership, you know, and uh, not just us, but with many others. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Volunteers and affected families traveled by ferry to Liberty Park in New Jersey to host a prayer service on October 13th, 2001, just a month after the Twin Towers collapse in New York City. The park is located across from where the towers formerly stood and over 300 people, including representatives from different faiths, the police and fire departments, and Knightsbridge International attended the event. Ten years later, Siji volunteers took part in two events to commemorate the 10th anniversary of September 11th. One took place in Battery Park, and the other was at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, just blocks from the World Trade Center. I live in this neighborhood, and I had a very, very hard time on 9-11. Every 9-11 I cry. I was hoping to get a little piece out of this, and I did. As interfaith clergy, leading congregations downtown here that have been involved with, with everything from 9-11 going forward, all of the events, all the recovery, reflection on what was going on, what can we do to make our community stronger and, 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 uh, and more together, more solid. Also in 2011, participants of the third annual Interfaith Unity Walk visited different houses of worship, including the temple atop Suji's building in Flushing. We all walk together today in different houses of worship to commingle with each other and learn the same language, love. Every year we strive to include new and different to commingle with different faiths and different communities. Zushi Foundation's name came up twice, even last year also, but then we tell, next year we'll definitely pick it. We thank Zushi Foundation for that, that they uh, hosted us very beautifully. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I now have the pleasure of being joined by Peter Gaditis, who's the Chief Response Officer here at NIDIS, which is the New York Disaster Interfaith Services. So welcome to our program, Peter. Thank you for having me. So I want to come back to the origins of NIDIS. What was the need from which it was born? Uh, it was born out of the city's response to the September 11th terrorist attacks and the need for faith-based organizations to share their unique voice. Uh, and to make sure that we were coordinating the resources that we had and the programs that we were making available. Peter, I'd also like to ask you about the interfaith ceremonies that you have for 9-11 every year. After 9-11, uh, the city made a decision that there would be no religious content to the formal city anniversary events. Out of respect for that decision, but out of a need for the faith community to express memory differently, to memorialize the dead and to support the families, we decided that we would join with a variety of faith-based organizations and have a 
faith-based memorial every year as well. One of the leaders of the faith community at the time designed a memorial service based on the Buddhist lantern ceremony. The Interfaith Center of New York, NIDIS, the United Sikhs, and a variety of other faith-based organizations decided that we would support that. We brought together religious leaders from about 20 different faith traditions to offer prayers, not together, but in their own unique expression. Interfaith worship is challenging, and we, instead of asking people to all do something that was uncomfortable, we wanted prayers to be offered in each different expression exactly as they would choose to offer them. Uh, so these religious leaders stand up and offer prayers for the dead. And then at the end of that, all the participants are given the opportunity to write messages on the lanterns, and then they're released into the Hudson River. The first year, there were just a couple hundred people. Uh, last year, there were well over a thousand. So it's really something that's become very meaningful. After having created this larger network, um, how is it that you are able to get all of these small groups to, to join? The challenge, I think, in the beginning was that many of the larger organizations had a voice uh, and the smaller organizations were challenged. As we were founding the organization, we wanted to make sure that we were creating a level playing field for all faith communities. Not all faith communities respect one another and get along well. So creating a, an environment that was neutral was important. So we tried to set up bylaws and structures. So can you tell me what NIDIS is composed of now? Uh, today, not during 9-11, it's made up of about 80 different Christian denominations and other faith traditions. What we're trying to do is bring all uh, agencies that are affiliated with a faith community that provide disaster-related human services into the Federation. So we're not designed to be uh, an interfaith center to represent every single faith tradition in the city. So what have been Midas's major achievements over the years? I do think that many of the programs that the organization administer are unique and they complement gaps in what are provided in the rest of the human services sector or by the government. Most of the preparedness work that we do is also unique. There really are no other organizations in the city helping all faith traditions prepare for disasters. And so those kinds of um, opportunities allow us to be a, an important player, if you will. Because not all the faith traditions, you said, either respect or like each other very much. So how is it that you're able to get them to work together? I mean, like with all coalitions, we're trying to find common ground. And amongst faith communities of, of all types, there is a theological uh, expression of compassion and justice. So we simply ask our members to focus on that one common theological theme for all of us to relieve human suffering in times of crisis. We all are organizations that rely on philanthropy, either from our own faith communities, our own congregations. So all of us, I think, have a vested interest in making sure that we're not wasting that money, that we're using it effectively, that it's getting to as many people as possible. If one of our faith traditions excels at rebuilding homes and another one is better at social work, then how do we put those two together to complement one another's work? Everyone is always interested in achieving that level of collaboration. When it's relatively calm, there aren't any immediate disasters, anything that needs immediate attention. How do you maintain the relationships that you forge during those times of disaster with these other organizations? Many of our members and our, the leaders that represent those faith traditions have become, over the years, colleagues and friends. But also, there are practical reasons, if you will, for collaborating during non-active periods. Most of us believe strongly that mitigation education and preparedness training are key to organizational readiness. So there's always work to be done 
to make sure that when something does happen, we can respond quickly and effectively. The more time we collaborate, the more time we spend together as partners, the easier it is to activate and respond. We've also created a variety of resources that have now been replicated nationally. Part of that, I think, is because of the wealth of expertise here in New York City and the diversity that's here. We were able to develop resources that spoke to other communities with a similar ecology. How does interfaith collaboration here in New York differ from the rest of the country? Even though the country is still majority Christian and majority uh, white, that has changed dramatically over the past 30 years. It's not unfamiliar to New Yorkers to be around diversity. You have to help a community recover across all these sectors, all neighborhoods, all people. It's the only way a community recovers because the, the, the way communities function economically and socially, you must address the needs of the whole community. And I think disaster interface, particularly in highly diverse communities, are one effective mechanism for ensuring that that happens. Well, speaking of community recovery, during critical moments, the prevalence of interfaith services that there is in the U.S., it's not quite there everywhere else. So what can you say about perhaps the popularity, if we can call it, of interfaith services during moments of great need? This is a diverse country by circumstance and to some extent by design. And so I do think when communities suffer, particularly when, when there's some sort of outrage, community sentiment usually swells behind the survivors um, and sort of embraces the victims' families. That is part of our culture. We also have a culture of philanthropy in the United States that's unique and a culture of volunteerism that's unique. When we do have international visitors that come to our office, I do think that that's something they always talk about. Looking at the way faith communities cooperate in the United States is something that they're a bit surprised by in some cases or envious about. You know, there are parts of the world where faith communities are openly violent toward each other. You know, can't we just agree to one thing together? Uh, you know, there are age-old histories that we don't have as the United States. We're only a 300-year-old country. So part of it is circumstantial, I, I think, and I, you know, that's hard to get your head around. But I do think it's possible, and I think that we should hope that we're an example to other countries around the world that it is possible for faith communities to get along and not resort to violence every time they have a conflict. Well, congratulations on all the achievements that you've made here through NIDIS, and thank you for joining our program. Thank you. And I'd like to also thank you for joining us on this program, and I hope that you gained a little bit of insight into volunteerism and interfaith dialogue here in the States. My name is Dinvash Hatterson, and I'll see you soon.